Very pleased for our final keynote um, of the day to welcome Neil Bush. Um, as you know, Neil Bush is the chairman of one of our nonprofit partners, the um, Points of Light Foundation. Um, you know, the Bush family has a legacy of encouraging every American to tap into the transformative power of helping others. And I think we've all been here experiencing the transformative power of, of helping others. It's, it's uh, uh, been a deeply moving event for all of us. Um, in addition to um, Neil's chairmanship of the Points of Light, he's also on the board of the Houston Salvation Army and of the Bush School of Government and Public Service. So um, without further introduction, I'd like you to ask you to please join me to uh, welcome to the stage uh, Neil Bush. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Sally for that very nice introduction. Um, I was so excited when Sally and David and, and Josh and the, the UBM team contacted me through Points of Light to ask me to deliver the keynote speech. Um, I come from a rather competitive family, and so I was, <laughs> so I was very proud of this, and I, and I called around to share this good news with my, my siblings and my family. I called George W. I said, George, you won't believe this, but I've been given this great honor, this great distinction of uh, speaking before the B4B conference in Anaheim, California. Um, some wonderful um, collaborations being established between nonprofits and, and corporations, and just a, it's a big honor to me. And he said, Neil, they called me three weeks ago, and I couldn't do it. I had the library opening happening and all these other things complicating his schedule. So I called Jeb, my brother Jeb, who uh, was governor of Florida, and during his governorship, he, he worked with a lot of volunteers. Uh, unfortunately, under his clock, there were like three major storms that battered Florida, and so there were a lot of relief efforts uh, that he had to help manage, and so he was the perfect, perfect guy. I said, Jeb, I'm speaking to this wonderful organization out in California. He said, yeah, they contacted me two weeks ago and I couldn't, couldn't make it. So I was a little disgruntled and slightly ego damaged. So I called my mother, you know, thinking that at least she might provide a little moral support to me. And as I was describing that I was in California, keynote speaker, she interrupted and said, Neil, I told them I couldn't attend, but they should try you because you're more, more likely to be available. Anyway, I'm happy to, happy to be here. Um, I got off the airplane today and I ran across a guy who was kind of looking me up and down. He's kind of a prototypical California-looking guy. I don't know what, what that guy looks like. I imagine him, you know, driving an electric car or something. But, um, and so he was looking me up and down. He says, has anybody ever told you that you look a lot like a bush? <laughs> and I said, yeah, sometimes. And he said, that must really piss you off. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> welcome to California, right, for a bush. Um, I am a bush, and I'm, I'm one of the unique individuals in America that has the, the um, unlikely relationship with two presidents in our country. And I often tell people that when my dad became president, it was a fulfillment of an expectation. As a kid, all the way to, to now, he's kind of ailing. I've always held him kind of in a hero status. He's been, you know, he could do no wrong, and, and he's so wise and so loving and so kind. And um, so when he became president, it didn't surprise me. When my brother George became president, I, I, I asked people, do you have brothers and sisters? When I talked to folks, and everybody raised their hand, I said, can you imagine your brother or sister being president of the United States. And so I, I, I tell the story that when I was eight years old, uh, my brother Marvin was six, George W. was 16, so he was much older and he didn't have time for us. Uh, so we would do anything we could to get his attention. And one night he agreed to play a game with us. He had a BB gun in his room. Um, and we, his room was at the end of a long hallway on the second floor. And he said, okay, tonight, before you go to bed, we had our PJs on. We're going to play a game. You guys are going to run across this hall as fast as you can. I'm going to count to 10. And so he pulled out his gun. He pumped it up, you know, as one of those pump guns. And, and I started running as fast as I could as he started counting. He got five, six, seven, eight, nine, and boom, and he shot me right in my ass. And I, and I, I say... 
he became president. You know, and if Saddam Hussein had known this about my brother, I'm not so sure his fate would have been, it should probably would have been a little different. Anyway, so um, enough of that. I want to I want to thank uh, David Levin and the UBM team, Josh and Sally and everybody uh, for hosting this uh, wonderful gathering, and we're so proud to be a part of it. Um, this is a, a, a successful and diverse company uh, that is shining a bright light on what it means to provide pro bono services to help the community of bright and shining points of light get together to help, to help uh, improve our lot. So my hat's off to UBM for all they've done in putting this together. I'm proud to serve as Chair of Points of Light, the largest organization in the world dedicated to volunteer service and to help promote one of my father's most important legacies. At his inauguration in 1989, my father spoke of all the individuals and community organizations spread like stars throughout the nation doing good. And as I look around this audience, um, there are so many great examples of bright and shining points of light that are doing wonderful things that have done for years and some rather new organizations that are doing wonderful things to help our communities, especially the community out here in Southern California. Um, the fact is that the organization I chaired didn't invent volunteerism. Volunteerism has been part of the American DNA ever since our founding fathers, starting with Benjamin Franklin. Uh, and since the founding of our nation, volunteerism has increased steadily. What my dad did do is lay the groundwork for the modern day service uh, volunteer movement uh, by creating the White House Office of National Service and passing in 1990 the National and Community Service Act, the first piece of legislation that encouraged and supported voluntary service. Every successive president has taken dad's initiative to new levels. Now, many people are unfamiliar with Points of Light, so I'm going to give you a brief advertisement for our good work. We help drive the service movement at the national level in se several ways. And we host the largest national conference focused on service and volunteerism. This year is going to be held in Washington, D.C., uh, June 19th through the 21st. Mark your calendars. Please join us. Now, we administer recognition programs, including the President's Volunteer Service Awards. We've distributed over one million certificates so far. And the Daily Points of Light Award, in the coming months, we will be giving our 5,000th Daily Point of Light Award. Last November, we worked with Bloomberg Business Week to publish the first ever Civic 50, showcasing 50 companies having the greatest impact through employee volunteering and meaningful nonprofit partnerships. IBM, Citigroup, and AT&T ranked at the top. Through our hands-on network, we support 250 affiliated volunteer centers throughout the world that foster partnerships with thousands of nonprofits. Many of you in this room hopefully have that relationship with your local volunteer center and corporations that engage more than 4 million volunteers and 30 million hours of service each year. One of our strongest and most effective affiliates is a co-host of this event, One OC. And we're very proud of our relationship with them and of what, what they do. We manage the only national monument focused on service called the Extra Mile in Washington, D.C. And our CEO, Michelle Nunn, and her team are thought leaders in the sector, opining and influencing and leading the movement. When the Points of Light was founded in, um, just a little over 20 years ago, there were 25 million Mer Americans serving. Now over 65 million Americans find their calling. We want to see that number climb to over 100 million. Ultimately, our mission uh, will not be complete until every American realizes his or her potential for helping others. The modern day movement sees more seniors serving. Statistics show that baby boomers and older Americans are over 40% more likely to serve um, than the same age groups in 1989. More faith organizations send more parishioners into the field. In fact, about a half of our nation's volunteers are called to serve through their church, their synagogue, or through other places of worship. More youth are volunteering. As more grade schools and universities are implementing 
service programs for their students. And as more college admissions officers are looking for service history for high school applicants applying for college, the volunteer rate for young people has grown from 13% to 22% over the past 20 years. And I'm proud of the work we do in that area through our Generation On division. I'm particularly excited about the role of the corporate world in promoting the service movement and very pleased with the work of our Points of Light Corporate in Institute. Many of you, I hope, have met our fearless leader of the Corporate Institute, Jackie Norris. She and her team are doing fabulous work. One important trend that is, uh, is that more businesses are implementing workplace volunteer programs, creating a positive corporate culture that research shows allows companies to recruit and retain more highly motivated employees. And for you nonprofits out there, I hope you find you're the beneficiaries of this trend of corporate involvement in their community. For those of you considering starting or enhancing volunteer programs within your company, consider this. In a 2010 CSR perception survey found that 40% of respondents were willing to take a pay cut to work at a socially responsible company. And 72% would sacrifice salary to support corporate social responsibility initiatives. The same survey found that 75% of consumers say corporate responsibility is important to them and that they are more likely to purchase products or services uh, from companies uh, that have, res have a, a responsibility agenda. Employees that serve side by side with their peers tend to be more loyal and workplace uh, and, and the workplace more productive and employees that, that volunteer are likely to influence their children helping to encourage future generations of volunteers. At Points of Light we see a convergence of four important trends in workplace volunteering and corporate philanthropy that are helping to drive service to game-changing levels of impact and scale. Pro bono services, micro-volunteering, alignment of the core business with social issues, and social entrepreneurship. More and more companies are dedicated to finding ways to be more strategic in deploying their talent into the community. Points of Light is proud to collaborate with Deloitte and the Case Foundation in an effort that promotes pro bono services called Billion Plus Change. In less than one year, 337 companies have pledged almost $2 billion worth of pro bono services. Our goal is to have 500 companies pledged to join the pro bono campaign, and I urge any company here that hasn't signed up to sign up today. The catalyst for this movement is simple math. The value of donated professional services is at least five times the value of traditional volunteers. So for those, those of you that are running nonprofits and you're spending money for accountants or you're spending money for graphical design people or if you're spending money for business planning, go to those companies in your community that, that can offer those services and make the case for them that their donation and services rendered through pro bono services is a lot, of a lot more value to you. So schools need to be uh, made over still. You can't just do pro bono service. Beaches still need to be cleaned. Homes need to be built. Food needs to be sorted. So every company needs to work with a volunteer center like, like the local center here or directly with agencies to deploy their troops in episodic activities. But finding ways to use professional talent to serve nonprofit agencies increases the value of the service provided. One way to increase the scale around pro bono work is through a phenomenon called micro-volunteering. Many employ employees want to help in substantive ways, but because of work and family commitments, they don't have the time to go into the field. The trend is to offer services entirely online for specific projects posted by a nonprofit agency. Think communications or marketing projects, a financial problem or graphical design need. The connections are made through platforms like Spark.com, utilizing the power of online applications and ubiquitous connectivity. At United Healthcare, for example, 1,447 people have teamed up to complete 800 challenges 
including Denver-based Diana Hamilton. Diana is a single parent with five children who single-handedly has completed over 50 challenges, ranging in size from helping to build a cancer resource database for a children's hospital to proofreading a fundraising letter. This is a great example of delivering high-value pro bono services through micro-volunteering. Another exciting trend is that more companies are finding that linking their charity and employee volunteer focus to specific causes helps to increase, imp helps to increase impact and build employee buy-in. One great example of, the for of this is IT&T Excellus, whose business is to provide vital supplies and equipment to our security forces around the globe. Excellus wisely chose to leverage the company's resources as well as the hearts and minds of their employees to support veterans and their families. The problems veterans face when they are deployed or upon their return home are vast, and yet the services are being underutilized. So Excellus first helped to fund the design and the development of a community blueprint, a vital toolkit bringing key stakeholders together Right now, it's being deployed in 17 communities to raise awareness and to increase capacity to help veterans find jobs, housing, and health care, to get financial and legal help, uh, to keep their families strong. Next, Excellus encourages employees to find their passion in helping veterans in their community, oftentimes in projects coordinated through a local volunteer center. Uh, Excellus's commitment to veterans takes corporate involvement in the community to a deeper level than other companies in their industry, trying, tying their employees to, the, to a comprehensive plan that will have great impact. One of the most exciting trends that has game-changing potential are the many examples of entrepreneurial enterprises that are being set up uh, both in the for-profit and in the non-profit uh, non worlds. I imagine some of you fall into this category. Recognizing the power of combining new world technologies with the unbridled passion and exuberance of young and some not so young entrepreneurs, Points of Light in partnership with Starbucks has established a civic incubator to, to help spur these kinds of innovative uh, organizations to be formed. I have no doubt that the service movement will scale more quickly as new approaches, new technologies, new socially responsible corporate efforts are launched. One such story is rather close to home. My daughter, Lauren, I don't know if many of you have heard of Lauren Bush. Lauren is the daughter who actually married a guy named, with the last name Lauren. So her name is actually Lauren Lauren, which is ironic. Um, Lauren, <laughs> she kept the bush in the middle just to keep it from being too confusing. Uh, my daughter Lauren, when she was at Princeton University, she was a model, um, and she was interested in world food, and so she served as a, an ambassador for the UN World Food Program. She's also interested in design, and so she designed products that she's now, for the last seven or so years, been selling under the brand Feed, Feed Projects. Now, um, Lauren has uh, managed to negotiate different distribution avenues for her product. Every time you buy a feed product, typically a handbag, but now there's a whole, whole variety of kinds of products, you know how many meals are going to be served originally in her business plan in Africa. So in the first phase of her business, she sold over $15 million of products. She donated over $6 million dollars to the UN World Food Program, and she caused 50 million meals okay. to be served. So, I'm sorry. Thank you for the, thank you for the interruption, I needed that, okay. Uh, I'm back. Um, so, but she's caused 50 million meals to be served in Africa. Now she's just negotiated a deal with Target um, she's, she's combining with um, national food organizations to provide over 10 million meals in the United States of America. You can go to Target starting this summer and buy any one of 50 products that are branded under the fee label. Um, these kinds of initiatives started by young people okay, whose vision for what they can do is unlimited, unbounded 
are the kinds of things that are going to change this world for the better. What all these trends have in common is a real partnership between companies and nonprofits. This really is not just about giving money, but about using all of your corporate assets to shape an issue, to impact communities. Companies can provide leaders for boards, space for meetings, in-kind donations for products. Companies can share talent and muscle to help, to help the community can pledge to join a billion and change our campaign to promote pro bono service, can support social entrepreneurs and help us move the needle from 65 million people serving to 100 million people. Nonprofit organizations can more effectively call on more people in the community to roll up their sleeves and to help in meaningful ways. That'll help move the needle from 65 million to 100 million people serving. My father said that any definition of a successful life must include service to others. His values were significantly shaped by his parents, and now the next generation of Bushes are carrying the legacy forward in new and powerful ways. Service has become an important part of our family DNA, as it has the Shriver family DNA. Our work at Points of Light won't be done until every company, every faith institution, every grade school and university uh, embraces a culture of service. Not until every family has as part of its DNA a culture of service. This is going to make our country a good, take our country from being a good country to a great country. Thank you for all you're doing to move the needle towards this goal. Let's march forth together. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm so happy that I didn't speak for 30 minutes. That would have been so boring. Um, I've got eight minutes left on the clock. And I've been told that if anybody wanted to ask questions or make a point, you know, I'd lo love to hear what's on your mind. I've got a few more humorous Bush stories if you're interested. <laughs> the socks, I don't know if you've seen my dad's recent, you know, he's gone through an eccentric stage as he's been aging. So he's been wearing funny socks everywhere and my mother's been making, poking fun at him. Anybody, there's a microphone here, you can just speak up. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you. I appreciate uh, your being here and hearing you speak. I heard your father speak years ago, and um, clearly uh, speaking skills run in the family. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm the founder and president of an organization called Sustainable Harvest International, and uh, one of the questions that uh, we've been working on, which I hoped you might offer some thoughts or insights on, is how we can engage more Americans in doing uh, sh short-term volunteer service uh, overseas to support the ongoing programs um, that we have going or that other organizations have going overseas. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in this field, but I'm amazed when I go to my church, for example, and hear of the organized efforts to send parishioners from my church overseas. I'm amazed at the work Lauren's doing in Africa. I'm amazed at the focus. My brother gets a lot of credit. You may be politically on the other side of the spectrum from my brother, but even people from the other side give him credit for promoting uh, issues related to Africa, in particular AIDS and, and malaria you know, relief. And so there's, I, I'm sh very surprised. I mentioned the Shriver family as being a family that stands out in my mind as a family whose DNA is deeply entrenched in service. You know, you look at what um, Sergeant Shriver did in forming the Peace Corps, and then, and then the, it, uh, kind of an aside, but the impact that all of Sergeant Shriver's commitment to service has had on every single one of the Shriver kids. Every one of them are devoting their lives, almost full time devoting their lives to some cause greater than themselves. And I'm so impressed. So I'm not sure to how to answer your question in terms of promoting more service overseas. Because I think that this country is one of our greatest exports 
is the fact that we are so benevolent and so kind. We're kind as a country, but, but individuals and institutions that are focused on solving problems spend so much time and so many resources overseas, more than any other nation. And it should be a source of great pride to all of us. And we can do more. Okay. We have five minutes left, <laughs> according to the ticker. You don't Hi. have to stay the whole time. Here I am. Yes. I'm Regina Ridley with the Stanford Social Innovation Review. I have a question about volunteering. I mean, it's been terrific that we've seen a big surge in volunteering in the United States, but it can also be a burden on nonprofits to manage volunteers. So I'm wondering if you have any advice for companies um, to uh, or nonprofits about a, how to ensure that volunteers won't be a burden on the nonprofit, right. but will be a help. That Thank is you. such an important question. It's a hugely important question in my mind. Uh, the reality is that if a volunteer participates in a project and that volunteer isn't put to, to useful work, then they're unlikely to want to volunteer again. So you could discourage volunteerism. And it also pr pr you know, presents a burden for the volunteer, th for the service agency. And so there's a, there's a thing called reimagining America. There are, there are volunteer centers and there are thought leaders who are developing plans, blueprints, for helping nonprofits figure out a way to, to mobilize, to recruit and use volunteers more effectively. And that's a really important part of the training that needs to be done. It's not just, you know, I want a volunteer, let me go to the local agency and provide, to see what I can do to help out. The agency has to be ready for it. I went to the food bank in Houston the other day. I have never seen a better organized use of volunteers in my entire life. And th this is a unique food bank in that they took over a huge warehouse, designed the entire production, including sorting of materials, the, the handling of the, the food that comes in, the sorting of it into baskets, blah, blah, blah. And they've got this whole production line where volunteers, and there were like three or four companies that had their employees there, and there were schools that had people there, and they were all being used. They had a training system built in that the volunteers could use, but it was so simple that they have this huge capacity for handling. They have a monster parking lot. I was like so surprised to see. And if every organization could be that thoughtful, in their strategic thinking about how to recruit and use volunteers so that they're effectively deployed, this, this number of 65 million going to 100 would go much faster. And, the, and those people they serve will be much happier. Their commitment to service will be much deeper. So it's a big, big, big problem. And, and a lot of good people are thinking about it, including Karen over here from Santa Cruz. There are a lot of people giving lots of thought to how to, how to better prepare nonprofits to, to work with volunteers. So as a fellow baby boomer, and like you, I don't look my age either. <laughs> the biggest from, problem is the glasses and having to print this in such a huge, I mean, I, it's a very frustrating. I oh, yeah. you, <laughs> Welcome I to the you. team. Yeah. So, you know, we've come from a generation of me to a generation of us. And to a lot of the people here in this room, they don't know what it was like 30, 40 years ago. So it's not so much a question, but as an opinion, but now seems to be the trend towards social consciousness and responsibility. If you were to look forward into your, your daughter's and your granddaughter's generation, and by the way, kudos to you for your candor, your sincerity, and your emotions when you come to speaking of your daughter. I give you great, <laughs> give you great credit for that. But what kind of societal changes do you see taking place outside the charity realm as far as you know, if we were to look forward 20, 30, 40 years, uh, you know, will it make an impact forever? Gosh, say that again, the last part. What's the, bro? Give, give me the question in another way. <laughs> it wasn't so much a question and opinion, but if we looked into 20 years, Future, 30 yeah. years down the road, you know, now the things that we're taking for granted are actually going to be ingrained in the societal changes. All right. So how will that actually transform itself into the way we as a country operate ourselves? I don't, I'm really not clairvoyant. I can't see into the future, but I'm very optimistic and hopeful. Um, I'll, I'll give you, and this isn't probably going to answer your question directly, but something that, that might um, impact the kind of future. I think charities now and, and causes are uh, attracting people, and people are attracted to, including young people, causes where there's an impact, where, where you can have an impact. 
And, and so uh, I like the idea of what Excellus was doing that I described, where they're bringing all the stakeholders together that have anything to do with veterans. It may not be the issue that's going to turn young people on. Maybe that issue is hunger. Maybe that issue is literacy. Maybe that issue is homelessness or something. But if we can have issue-driven, you know, blueprints established, where there are collaborations among nonprofits, where there's a sharing of information, where there's a raising of awareness, where there's a capacity that's built, then I think you're going to see the natural tendency for young people who have this real passion for doing something and doing it you know, in different ways, they'll come up with ways to, to fill that need, to play a role in, in th that campaign, if you will. And so I'm sorry, I'm not, probably not answering your question, but I'm excited about the idea that cause-related, you know, motivation to serve, not just the Boys and Girls Club, but what's the Boys and Girls Club's role, for example, in solving literacy and making America 100% literate? And there, there is a role. And what, you know, so finding the role in solving a massive community problem is going to bring lots of agencies together, lots of companies together, lots of faith organizations, bring government, all these things together in a way that's going to have a huge impact. And I think that's kind of the a, a next wave of, of activity that's going to drive our movement. We've got one last question for this young lady, and the clock is ticking down. Um, my name's Lynn. I'm with a for-profit startup. And I'm I still love like, that. I'm still like in the process of getting you know things going, and just wondering. You mentioned a civic incubator, and along yes. with nonprofits, I mean, helping for-profits that have a social mission get started. Right. What kind of you know? How can we kind I, of you reconnect know, those resources so that? You know, I think there's a lot of people with great ideas, but they just don't know how to kind of pull those resources together to get right. things going. I mean, if you Google things, you can find your way through. I mean, there's lots of research you can do. That's a, I love that you're doing that. I, have, I really am so inspired by it. My daughter did it. I met a guy the other day in Houston that's starting a, a for-profit deal to help teachers. It's like the um, You Choose type plat platform, but he's got a different twist on it to help teachers procure things that they're coming out of pocket to pay for now. I love the fact that young people, and our incubator takes applications. We provide $50,000 grants. I think I'm looking at my board member, Jeff Hoffman, here to know the specifics. But we provide grants to these startup enterprises, and they get the additional benefit of working with a team of other entrepreneurs and with successful business people to kind of think through their concepts and help develop their concepts. I, I, I would, If I were you, I would go in your community to a business consulting firm like Deloitte or somebody and say, look, I'm trying to start this from scratch. And I know you guys are devoted in part of your work to professional services to help th think through strategically how to do things. And yours is for profit, so you might have a little more difficulty than a nonprofit might, <laughs> might have. But they may say, you know, we love this idea. We love your spirit. We love the fact you're trying to do this. Here's what we would do, and they'd offer to donate or give, your, give you this kind of, I would, I would knock on every door you can. Be entrepreneurial, and don't, and don't take no for an answer. And here's the other thing. You're going to, I was an entrepreneur in the education world in a for-profit way, and it was such a great passion of mine to, to liven up middle school classrooms because I think they're boring as hell. And I think the young people today have so many alternatives than the textbook when they go home, you know, that kind of thing. And so I came up with the idea of generating curriculum that aligned with state standards. It had music and animation and video and blah, blah, blah. And it took, I don't know, about eight years and $42 million that I raised to develop a huge inventory of curriculum. And it's never taken off. And yet I don't regret one minute of the work I, I did on it. Because you never know. I mean, what you're doing may change. I don't. What are you doing again, real quick? I'm out of time, but I'm starting an international um, botanical product business to do environmental stewardship and social um, justice. So that could that could change the world in the ways that you're trying to change the world. And and my hats off to you and everyone else in this room that might be inspired by your work. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thank you.